Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My joy to be in Gospel Light Baptist Church and on the program for the Sword Conference. My privilege. I hope I'll enjoy the privilege in the future, but I don't have too much future to enjoy. <laughs> but I have enjoyed the past a great deal. When I come to this place, I, my mind goes back to a lot of good memories of Gospel Life Baptist Church. Some of you have never been in this church, church before. You are now in the largest Baptist church in the two Carolinas, and probably in Virginia also, maybe in, I don't know about Tennessee, but two large churches in the Carolinas is right here. And I began preaching in this church when they had 200 in Sunday school in the little block building down the street about 300 yards, way back in the uh, 40s, or early 50s. And uh, poor Bobby became pastor. And I watched it grow and develop until my heart is fascinated and astounded and filled with gratitude that God used Bobby Robinson and these dear people to build this great monument, citadel of the faith here in the age of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And, and I told uh, Dr. Kennedy a moment ago, the sign here gives you Bobby Robinson in a nutshell. If you'll look at it and think about it for a moment, you'll see uh, the type man that he is. And he's exactly what the signs suggest. And we could all learn a lesson at that particular point. When, he, when I began preaching for Bobby, I called him Bobby. I don't call him Bobby anymore because he's gotten to be an older man and he's now Dr. Robinson. But uh, I've, I've watched him grow from a young preacher and he's never deviated as far as his spirit, his humility, his earnestness, his tears, his message, and his faith in the Bible is concerned. I've changed a bit. He's still a Bible-believing independent Baptist. And I rejoice in Dr. Robertson. And the name, of the, the title by his name on the sign, Brother, uh, gives you what he is in one word. He's that. He's a brother to God's believing children. And he's a spiritual father to many of these folk who were saved right here in his ministry down through the years. I don't know exactly how long Bobby's been here, but but I would imagine uh, probably 35 years. I just can't remember exactly. But uh, he's been right here steady. And his son's at his side now to help him. I commend them. I praise God for the church. Get acquainted with with Brother Bobby Robertson before you leave. And more than just a handshake, talk to him and let him fellowship with you. I don't see him. Hey, old boy. God bless you. I appreciate Bobby. And I wanted to say that in earnestness and sincerity. And then I appreciate Brother Curtis Hudson. I think God's choice for the sword of the Lord. Uh, I knew Dr. Rice before I knew Dr. Hudson. And uh, I had nothing to do with his selection as the editor. I've been on the cooperating board of the sword for many years, but Dr. Rice evidently made that decision himself. At least I'm satisfied that he did. And then I'm satisfied with his choice. I don't think he could have done a better job in choosing Curtis Hudson, whom I've known all his preaching life too. I knew him when he was pastor of a, a church down in Atlanta. I was just small when I first preached for him in Atlanta many years ago. But it grew into a large church like this one. And I appreciate his ministry. And now I especially appreciate his ministry with the sword of the Lord, as do you. And I thank you, Brother Hudson, for allowing me the privilege in my old age to be on this program. I deeply appreciate it with all of my heart. Then I have a busload of the finest people in South Carolina with whom I drove up, or uh, rode up on the Greyhound today. God bless you for coming. I'd like for the folk at Tower to just stand up wherever you are. I don't see you either. But just stand up, will you? Uh, yeah, they are back there and down here in the front. She got it around. And the uh, finest and the most beautiful lady in the crowd is my wife. You believe that. Uh, thank you for standing up. I appreciate that. My wife and I have been married almost 58 years. And we were back where we started, just she and me, 
and she leans on me and I lean on her. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have her to help me walk. I have my senior gravis. I don't know if you ever heard that or not. But it's a failure of your automatic muscular system in your body. And I've been bothered with it about 10 years. And one of the symptoms is the fact that your legs don't operate right. And sometimes my eyes don't operate right. Sometimes my tongue doesn't operate right. And uh, right now I seem to be doing all right, but I get to the place where I can't talk. Sometimes I can't swallow. Brother, that's an ordeal when you're seated at a great big table of wonderful food and you can't eat it. <laughs> I've been where I couldn't bite your finger. If I had the finger, your finger uh, in my mouth, I couldn't bite it. You have no strength in your jaws. That's my senior gravis. And there's no cure for it. It's terminal, but uh, uh, you carry the rest of your life. But there's no pain. I have no pain at all, not a pain. I sometimes wish I could have a headache. At least I knew it had something of that ache. But I have no pain at all. But I do have the my senior gravis, and the effect of it shows up every once in a while. I, 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 I lose my balance. That's why Dr. Kennedy had me to the platform. The most beautiful thing in the world is a stair railing. And the next most beautiful thing in the world is a place where you can lean up. I need them both constantly. But when I don't have the, the uh, banister, the railing, I, uh, Brother Kennedy, one of the fellows from the church, help me if I need it. And if I had to walk up those steps without something to touch, something to touch, uh, I'd get frightened and I'd stagger and I may fall. So I did you not know, do that. In the last six months, I've fallen five times. And brother, when I fall, that's a calamity. <laughs> the one I haven't broken a bone, but I haven't. Praise the Lord. But I have fallen, and I don't want to do that unless I have to, especially with all you good people looking at me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> that's an embarrassing thing to fall. I was going in a McDonald's restaurant down in Alabama. The Greyhound was carrying me somewhere to preach down in that area, and I got off the bus, and all the others were already going into the cafe, uh, into the restaurant. And my wife and I were the last one to get off. And, uh, and, and walk into that cafeteria, uh, the restaurant, I fell. Right on the cobblestone, fell on the grass. I knew it was going down, couldn't stop it, couldn't have it. But I don't think any of our people saw it. When I got up, brushed myself off a little bit, and I had to help to get up. I can't get up. When I fall, I have no one to help me get up. But I was so glad they didn't see me. My people didn't see me. Uh, they might not have known that until I told, told it then. But my wife saw me, and she rushed to me and helped me get up. And uh, so the Lord's been good, and I appreciate the goodness of God. Isaiah 55 in your Bible. And that's page number 300, number 762. That's Schofield. If you don't have a Schofield Bible, you're leaving under a great disadvantage. You get your a Schofield Bible. KJV, the old edition. Uh, don't, don't you bother the new translation of the Bible. Uh, I'm, I believe in the King James Bible. In all these years, I've found nothing wrong with it. When I was a student in college, I graduated from Furman in 1946, where some of you were born. They insinuated to me that the Bible was filled with many contradictions and mistakes. And in all these years of preaching, I haven't found the first one. Looks to me like I would have stumbled over one of them by this time. <laughs> so a long time ago, I'm convinced there are no contradictions, nor mistakes in this Bible I have before me. It's God's Word, and I believe it's God's Word for us in our day. Here's my text in verse 11, Isaiah 55, verse 11. A familiar text you've probably heard uh, many times. I've quoted it many times in my preaching, but I've only preached for it probably a time or two. First to my people at Tabernacle, God gave me a text uh, in my ministry, the first people to hear it is Tabernacle. I tell them sometimes they've heard all I know and some things I'm not certain about. And so but I will repeat it again today and I hope it will be a blessing to you. In verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Uh, that uh, first clause in verse 11 uh, refers to the context and I'll get back to the context in a moment, uh, beginning with verse number 7. And then the context follows with verse number 12 as well. But the first clause in verse 11 refers to the preceding context. 
so shall my word, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Now, God places his word above his own name. You pen knife the Bible, you might just as well look God in the face and say you don't exist. Be the same thing, be as bad or not worse. Now, this book ought to be precious to you and I. Sometimes you ought to hold it to your breast. Sometimes you ought to hold it to your lips. Sometimes you ought to thank God for his word. The word of God is a foundation to, of, of everything that we stand for as born again believers. Can you imagine not having the scriptures, not having the word of God? All that I know about salvation, I learned from the Bible. The way to get to heaven, I learned from the Bible. And the fact that I'm saved and assured of it, I learned from the Bible. Amen. The promises of God's word, I discover in the Bible. They're, uh, they're a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And the assurance that I have that I'll never be separated, never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus, I learned from the word of God. Amen. The fact that I'm going to become resurrected out of the grave someday, I learned from the word of God. And that means more to me than maybe some of you. I'm, I'm going to die. All of us are going to die. I don't especially love the idea of it, but I cannot reverse the fact of it that I'm going to die. But when I die and they plant my body in the city of the dead, I'm going to come forth out of that grave. Amen. The Bible tells me that. Amen. Except the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, John 12. But if that grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it's going to come forth. And we're coming out of the ground someday. That's, that's a law. That's a law that God set uh, up in his, in his own economy. And everything that's alive in the earth today uh, is alive because it came out of the earth. The grass, the seeds of the field, the farmers plant around about us. All must die. And then it comes out of the soil after it dies. Or one day I shall die. And I'm coming out of the grave at the second coming of our Lord. I learned that from the Bible. Yeah. The so-called wise men in the theological world smile at that, scoff at the idea, and mock you and I for being, for being fundamental Bible believers. Yeah. They scoff at the second coming of our Lord. Well, my friend, you'll never take that away from me. Okay. I hope and assuredly believe that when he shall appear, I shall appear with him in the resurrection. And I learned that in the Bible. Everything I know about God in heaven and how to get there, I learned that from the Bible. My weapons of warfare are the word of God that I use against the wiles of the devil. And without the word of God, I'm an open prey to the devil and to the enemy. But with the word of God, we're more than conquerors for him that loved us. And we can anchor this uh, upon this book. Whatever the Bible says is so. I was talking with one of the uh, uh, brethren with them on the bus today about the 23rd Psalm. Uh, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. And right at the present moment, I don't have dying grace. I've had all kinds of grace you can think of. Saving grace, living grace, tithing grace, preaching grace, persecuting grace. I've had all the grace you can think of except one. I've never had dying grace, but I've never died. But when I come to death, God shall give to me new grace, dying grace. And I believe the best day I'll ever live will be my last one. God shall be more real to me in that last moment. The psalmist David and his psalm will be more real to me then than ever before. Dying grace. It'll be a good experience, a blessed experience. I'm ready. I'm not anxious to die. But when that day comes, I think God will take the sting away. Right now, the sting of death is real. I stood by the bedside of one of my members uh, one day this week at my same age, Brother Darby, Brother Kennedy. He's so pitiful. He's having uh, difficulty breathing. And he and I are the same age. And I looked at him and said to myself, that could be me. And I said, Brother Darby, can you, can you sleep on your back? Can you lie down and sleep at night? He had to be propped up, you know, to get his breath pitiful. And he said, Pastor, I'm tired. 
I'm so tired. And I would imagine laboring for every breath would soon exhaust a man. I've never had that experience. Maybe someday I may have that. Maybe you. But isn't it consoling to know that Jesus said, I'll be with you in the valley of the shadow of death all the way. Now learn that from the Bible. The skeptics and the modernists tell you where some other place will Bible believe us. All the Bible is divinely inspired of God and is for your admonition and for your encouragement. That's the word of God that the Isaiah speaks of in verse 11. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. And over and over again in the Bible, we find the written word of God, things uh, that God spoke himself uh, and gave to the prophets to record in this precious book. And as far as I'm concerned, they are literally, actually the word of God. Amen. And we revel in it and marvel in it with thanksgiving. Now look at the next clause in verse 11. It shall not return unto me void. Now there's my text. The word of God shall not return unto me void. There'll be no pacifist in heaven uh, demonstrating against the Bible. There'll be no activists in heaven who say, we found out that it's not so. The word of God cannot be disputed nor denied, nor shall it ever return unto God void. The power of God unto salvation is the word. The power of the gospel is the word. There can be no gospel without the word of God, you see. The word is the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God, the dynamite of God, as I've heard Dr. Robinson repeat so many times. The dynamite of God uh, under salvation. And so it is. It shall not return. That is, the word shall not return unto me void. And if I understand what that text means in a simple uh, statement right now, it simply means that all that God purposes and proposes to do with his word will not fail. Would you agree with that? Can you imagine up in heaven, God saying to Peter, say, Peter, uh, you had a big day down at Pentecost and 3,000 converts were made. But some of the boys over in North Carolina and South Carolina right now are not reaching quite that many. What went wrong, Peter? What's wrong? Why aren't the folk in North Carolina reaching great multitudes? And we aren't. Nor South Carolina either. We aren't at Tabernacle. We'll reach a few, but not, not great multitudes. Some Sundays we have nobody saved. Now, I've heard preachers say, I've had somebody say it every Sunday for 10, 12 years. I can't say that. No. I go through a Sunday, nobody comes forward. Right at home, I say to my wife, I would somebody come forward to the altar today and become converted. And uh, my wife would agree. And then I say to her, but I'll be back tonight. Yeah. Same time, same station, same gospel. Yeah. And I say to the Lord, I'll be back tonight. I'm not about to change my method. I'm not about to change my message. I'll be back tonight. Or I'll be back next Sunday. We have only one gospel to preach. And I submit to you, the gospel has never failed, is not failing today, nor ever shall fail. Well, how do you explain churches not multiplying and growing? Becoming mammoth churches like gospel light. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't understand this one. I think Bobby is a wonderful man and worthy of all God used him to accomplish. But Bobby would be the first person who would say, I didn't do it. Uh, he didn't do it. And I agree with that. Somebody came to me the other day and said, why don't you write a book on how to build a church? I said, well, I think I can handle that right into the book, but I don't know how to build a church. <laughs> Preacher, you're being trying to be funny. No, I'm serious. I don't know how to build a church. If I were to leave Tabernacle, I'm too late now to leave Tabernacle, they're going to have to nurse me to the grave. I'm not about to leave Tabernacle now. <laughs> but where would I go to begin with? Where would I go to build a church? I have no idea. I have no burden of any other place. I don't know how to build a church. 
If a church is built, God must do it. Whether it's a big church or a small church, God must do it. If converts are made, God must do that. If mission programs are built, God must do that. We're not able. We, uh, the, the battle is the Lord's. They that labor, labor in vain, unless the Lord build the house. My word shall not return unto me void, says my text. Now let me read the rest of the verse. Thou hast, uh, uh, it says further in verse number 11, uh, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Now I would that you'd remember that. Now I didn't say that, I'm reading. Does your Bible read that way? Yeah. Well, if it does, you have a King James. Yeah. It shall accomplish that which I please. God said that. And he's talking about the word, this word I have in my hand. This is the only word we know. It's the only word we have. And he said about this word, it will accomplish, it will accomplish that which I please. And further than that, he goes on to say, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Two tremendous profound statements made by God himself and reported by Isaiah. Now it seems that we could believe that. And I do believe that. I, I'm not a pessimist about the church. The church is the most wonderful organism on the earth. Nothing can touch it. No civic organization, no secret order. Nothing can touch the hem of the garment of a local assembly of born-again baptized believers. Whether it's a big church or a little church, doesn't make a great deal of difference. But there's nothing on earth more wonderful than a local church. And uh, we are in the business of handling the Word of God, preaching, teaching, defending, expounding the Word of God, obeying the Word of God. That's our business. And God said, it's going to accomplish that which I please. Not what you please. But carefully God said, that which I please. A lot of pastors love to have Brother Bobby Robinson's advantage in his pulpit. Well, why can't I do that? I don't know the answer to that. Nor do you. But maybe God will use you if you'll be humble and submissive and stay busy at the job and preach the word. Be faithful to the book. Faithful in Christian living. Maybe God will do that for you, but I couldn't guarantee that. See, I'm not God. He said that which I please. And it shall prosper, it shall prosper in accomplishing the thing that I send it to accomplish. Amen. It'll work. According to God's program, not ours. Now let's look at the context just, context just a moment. Look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now that's a great text, isn't it? I like what uh, Curtis said a moment ago about being justified. That covers a lot of sins, doesn't it? When you're justified by the grace of God. Now in verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Any objection? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Brethren, that puts us behind the barn. That takes us out of circulation. I know the God talking, but I don't know his thoughts. Nor do you. I don't know all of his plans. I have to learn God's plans day by day. I'm in no position to predict uh, anything for the church, this church or tabernacle of yours. Because my thoughts are not your thoughts. The next clause says, neither are your ways my ways. What you think is the right way might not be. What you think is the right time might not be. What you think is the right results may not be. My ways are not your ways. Anybody object to that? No, sir, you have to fall in line and say, yeah, Lord, that's right, that's right. Your thoughts are greater than my thoughts. Your ways are greater than my ways. I'll obey, doing the best I can with the knowledge you give me. 
Now look at the next verse, number nine. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Now that's a fact, and he simply gives an illustration of what he says in verse eight. As the heavens are higher than the earth, you know that for a fact. You can see that. You've been up in an airplane, and you can see the uh, the the clouds beneath you. We are beneath the clouds now, but there's been times when you've been above the clouds and I. But down below the clouds is the earth. So all of us will admit the heavens are higher than the earth. And so it says in the last clause, so are my thoughts higher than yours, and so are my ways higher than yours. So much greater until we're not able to fathom God's thoughts and God's ways. I stand amazed at what God does. I literally stand amazed. Now over Tabernacle, Dr. Kenny and I call them tokens. God gives us a token every once in a while. Uh, unexpected blessing uh, in finances and in, uh, in uh, other experiences of grace of sinners. God gives us a token every once in a while. And those tokens sure are wonderful. I stand on the receiving end. Anytime God has a token, I need it. And he knows when I need it. And he sends the tokens in. Amen. I could tell you some, some miracles, at least I think they're miracles, that God does uh, regularly. And I give you thanksgiving. But I don't know when that's going to happen. I could receive a token today. In fact, I'm receiving now a token from the Lord for the privilege of being on this program of the Sword Conference. So I'm so thankful for that with all my heart. The tokens of God. We can live by the tokens of the Lord. It is a token. A token is a guarantee that there's something better than that. On store, just wait, and you'll get the real McCoy. But sometimes God gives you a token of it, and you can enjoy that while you're waiting, you see. Look at the next, verse 10. For as the rain cometh down... And as the snow cometh down from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it, maketh it bring forth uh, food, and make bring forth bud, and bring forth seed for the sower, and bread for the eater. As the rain and the snow cometh down from heaven, and returneth not thither, now, that, that's an illustration of what the Word of God does. Uh, down in South Carolina and in North Carolina, we've had a, quite a drought. Some of you from other states might not have had quite a severe drought. But the crops in both these states have been, have been affected by the drought. And we've sure given anything. In, 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 in Greenville, last month, rainfall zero, nothing in July. A little bit in August so far, but way short. And the crops reflect it. But when the rain comes down and the snow comes down, there is a divine purpose in that. And I think God handles that in his own economy, in his own way. Now the rain comes and it doesn't return. The snow comes and it doesn't return. But instead, the rain and snow waters the ground so that out of the ground, there may, uh, a seed may come for the sower and for the eater of bread. We're totally dependent upon that rain and snow for bread and for seed. And that tells me that we're totally dependent upon God for the prosperity of the gospel and the prosperity of the word of God, you see. If I know my heart, and I'm, I, I'm not a novice, I'm an old man, I believe this book. Every bit of it. All of it. Miracles, I believe all of them. So do you. We are a fundamental Bible-believing group, and I'm happy that we are. But that being the case, uh, doesn't mean that God has turned it over to you or turned it over to me. We're totally dependent upon the Lord as much as we're dependent upon the snow and the rain so that seed will be here for the next year's crop and bread for the table in the meantime. We're dependent upon the Lord. Now having said those things, the text. 
Now let me read that text again, then I want to note uh, the other side of the context. So shall my word be. Verses 7, 8, and 9 simply introduce us to the clause, first clause in verse number 11. So or likewise my word shall be. And this is God's word. Amen. I know a great deal of it from memory, not all of it by any means. But all of it from Genesis to the Revelation is the word of God and it's mine. Amen. It's yours. Amen. We are believers, sincere believers in the word of God, aren't we? Amen. And so he says, so shall my word be. Amen. As the rain and the snow is sent for a purpose, so God sends his word for a purpose. So God uses his word in his own time, in his own way. That goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. Amen. I've heard preachers say, and I've said it myself, I guess, time or two down through the years, we had a barren day, and I was rebuked in the Lord, and of the Lord, for using that kind of terminology. It dawned upon me, there's no such thing as a barren service. If it's a Bible service, and a Jesus service. There's no such thing as a barren service. I think I understand what people mean, preachers mean when they use that terminology. They mean nobody got converted. But that's no indication the service was barren. There might have been a hungry, lonely heart that was lifted up and blessed of God. There might have been a man in the service that was impressed to write a check for a thousand dollars to the mission program. There might have been some reconciliation that needed to be made in the congregation that was affected that day that you called a barren day. Amen. If we could see the result of all that God does in every service where the word of God is lifted and preached, we'd be dumbfounded and amazed Amen. at what God does. So you stop using that terminology. We understand what you mean. We're not faulting it necessarily. But it's really not a good term to use. I don't think God was, fail, or was wrong when he said, My word shall not return unto me void. Amen. 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 Now, I don't know how I'm going to preach next Sunday Tabernacle. God will give me something. He has for a long time, and he'll give me something. But whatever that message may be next Sunday, I can count on God using that. Right. If I give it in the right spirit yeah. and the right attitude, yeah. I can count on God using yeah. that. Yeah. Now, it may not be exactly what I dream or what I'd like, but God's going to use it. Yeah. My word shall not return unto me void. I've been preaching on the radio 51 years. The bright spot hour goes out over 77 radio stations across the land. Some powerful stations. And I'm so glad for the years. And I stand before a microphone like this one. So mine is much older, much bigger. Uh, but anyway, it's a mic. And sometimes the old devil gets on my shoulder and says, you don't see anything. You're preaching to that microphone. Nobody listening out there. Nobody listening out there. Why don't you quit? Takes a lot of money and a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it does. Why don't you quit, says the devil. And I remember this text. My word shall not return unto me void. My word. I could tell you a lot of stories, but I'll not take time to do that. But let me mention this one. A lady over at Greensboro, not far from where you live, one day wrote to me a letter and said, I hear you on the radio. I didn't know she was listening to me. God knew I didn't. And she said, I'm 55 years old, and I'm a drunkard and a doper. And uh, I've had six children. Three of them died as infants because, infants because of social disease in my body. Now imagine that she might have been a prostitute. I don't know that. But she said, I don't want to go to hell. There's any hope for me, a person like me. Well, now, what prompted that letter? I didn't know the lady. Nobody called on the phone and told her to write to me. But there's a woman, maybe in a hotel room. I don't know where she was. 
which said, I'm so dirty until I didn't even want to write the letter. I handled the paper that you'd have to handle to read my letter. A vile, wretched sinner. But is any hope for me? Well, I stopped what I was doing and sat down at the top right and I wrote her back and I said, there's a bomb in Gilead. I said, there's a sympathizing Savior. I said, though your sin be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. I said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And I put those good promises in the letter and sent it back to her. And a few days later, I received another letter. And she said, tis done. The transaction is done. She said, I'm now saved. Well, now, all that was the result of the Word of God. It could have been your lips as easily as mine. He could have been your convert as easily as she was my convert. I was simply a vehicle that spoke the word of God. It was the word of God that got a hold of our heart. I can't resist telling you the climax of that story. Six, eight months later, I was in Greensboro preaching. I passed the care out to the cafeteria for dinner on Saturday. Went through the line, going through the line. I told her about the lady who'd gotten saved. I'd love to baptize her, but I lived 200 miles away. And when I finished uh, telling the story, we'd have our food ready to sit down and eat the food. I couldn't think of the lady's name. Because you never have that problem. Sometimes I do. But, uh, like the man I heard went to the doc said, Doc, it's bad how I forget people's names. Can you help me? And the doctor looked at him and stroked his chin. After his day, she said, how long has this been going on? The fellow said, how long has what been going on? Well, I'm almost that bad, not quite. But I said, Preacher, I'm sorry. I can't remember the latest name. I'll write to you and give it to you when I get home. And a little girl, about, about 10 years old, walked up to me and handed me an envelope. And on the front was that uh, was Bright Flower. And I turned and looked at the back side, and there was the latest name. Now, that's a miracle. How did I know that was going to happen? Do you think God had that in the making all the time? That was one of the little tokens I was talking about a while ago. And I said, Preacher, here's a miracle. I told you about the lady who forgot her name. Here she is three tables away from me. And I said, Pastor, excuse me. And I left my food and my pastor friend. And when a man my side leaves food, that's something shut up. And I went and sat down with that lady. She began telling me how good it was to be saved. Tears began to run down her cheeks. And on the other side of the table, I was laughing in the spirit. I laughed and clapped my hands, and she wept and testified. I don't know what the people in the cafeteria thought, but we had us a camp meeting right there in the cafeteria. Now, I didn't do any of that. I was just on the sidelines when God did it Amen. through his word. Amen. And what he did for me, he's done for you time and time again. It shall not return unto me void. So when the devil gets on my shoulder, I tell him that story. He knows about it. <laughs> Amen. I believe the gospel, the word of God is dynamite. The gospel built this lovely church. And gospel light is not this building, but a lovely congregation whom I appreciate in the Lord greatly. The God brought this congregation together, Bobby. I remember when you didn't have it, have it. I remember some you used to have now here in the cemetery. Good people. But God's given you a great church. But he brought them in. He brought them in. He put it on their heart to come. He gave you the converts. It's all wrought and accomplished, this great complex, by the word of God. Amen. My word shall not return unto me void. Now look at that text again. It says, but it shall accomplish that which I please. When I preached in a little block building down the street, down the road, I had no idea this building would be here. I went to build the one next door. I thought that was a token, sure enough. Tremendous building next door. And then that was outgrown. And they built this one a few years ago. Who would have thought it? I had no idea. But don't you know the great architect who knows the end from the beginning knew all the time what was going to happen in gospel life. 
and he selected one of the most humble men I've ever known in my life to be the pastor and the leader. God knows what he's doing. He put you where you are. Well, I can't build a gospel life. Maybe God doesn't mean for you to build a gospel life. Maybe he wants you to pastor 150 people. Nothing wrong with that. I've done that in my life. Bobby did that in his life right here in the same church. You're not too good to do the same thing. But it will accomplish that which he pleased. And then it goes on to say, it will prosper. The word shall prosper in the thing. Now, I'm not prepared to tell you what that thing may be in your life. Maybe a large church like this one, maybe a small church. Maybe a radio ministry, maybe a mission program. Or whatever the thing may be that God has in mind. And we just read it a while ago. His thoughts are higher than ours. So I'm not going to interrogate God and say, you've got to let me in. You're going to have to tell me what you're thinking. No, he's not going to tell you what he's thinking or tell you what he's going to do. You'll have no dream about what you're going to do. What you're going to do is to be faithful every day you live. Amen. And if God sees it to bless you in a spectacular way, wonderful. If he doesn't, you can be faithful till you die. Amen. Amen. Faithful. Back in these mountains, there are hundreds of what some people call little preachers. Some of the greatest souls I've ever known are back there. As far as I'm concerned, there's much in God's will in one of those valleys of the hundred and Sunday school as you are here at Gospel Light, Bobby. Amen. And I know you wouldn't think otherwise. I know how you feel. But if you get the idea that I'm a big preacher, no, you start putting brother in front of your name. That's one step down to where you live. It'll help you to do that. Amen. So it'll accomplish that which God plans it accomplish. Now that'll make an old man's heart glad. I'm about to read that in the book. That helps me. Every Baptist preacher ought to die with a thousand unfulfilled dreams. I have dreams at Tabernacle. Thank God what he's done. But I have dreams things I'd like to see done at Tabernacle. And they're varied. Much of it is ministry. Much of it is mission activity. Much of it is evangelism. But I have dreams at Tabernacle. I don't think I'll ever live to see all of them fulfilled. But I thank God for those I have seen fulfilled, you know. I'm blessed by what he's already done. And so I'm moving on to be faithful. Now look at verse number 12. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. You ever Bible read that way? You ever heard of a pastor burning out? I've been reading about that in some publications. Pastors burning out. Man, that's ridiculous. Pastors burning out. Curtis said he ought to retire, suggested maybe I should retire. I don't find that word in the Bible. I read the Bible, and he died, and he died, and he died. <laughs> That's my retirement. Now look at that verse again, number 12. And ye shall go forth with joy. The pastor, the preacher, long ago said he'd been preaching a long time, but he gets more joy out of his preaching and from his ministry now than ever. That ought to be that way. Amen. And it's that way with a man much older than he is. I'd rather be what I am now. Not much. But I'd rather be crippled up. And still able to preach a little bit than anything I know. Amen. 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 I can go forth with joy. And be led forth with peace. Amen. And as a result of that. The mountains and the hills. That's the kingdoms. And the uh, 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 valleys shall break forth before you in the singing. And the community around Walker Town has done that for Bobby. They break forth unto singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands because of you being faithful to this precious book. 
If you want people to clap their hands about your ministry, be faithful to that book. Amen. Faithful in preaching that book. Faithful in defending this book. Amen. But look at the next verse. Instead of thorns, if you'll preach the word and believe it, instead of thorns, that's unpleasant. Nobody's interested in a thorn. You want to burn the thorns, get rid of the thorns. Instead of thorns, shall come up fir trees. That's something beautiful. In my backyard at my home in Greenville, I have five trees that I took up out of the ground in the mountains in Tennessee. Brother Stewart, our bus driver, uh, I see a tree on the side of the road that grow up there. Wow. Now in my country, that's, that's a, a beautiful stuff. We stopped and pulled them out of the ground. Brother Stewart put them in my yard for me. And I have now one or two all as high as the ceiling. I look at them and marvel at their beauty. God will do your life that way. He'll get rid of the thorns and give you fir trees if you'll stand by this book. Yeah. Now, brethren, this is in my context. It is. It sure is. Yeah. And you're not going to interpret any scripture apart from the context. And I'm trying to preach from verse 11. But the result of verse 11 is that the thorns disappear and the fir trees come up. Amen. And all of that, but the briars shall disappear and myrtle trees shall come up. Yeah. Sweet smelling myrtle trees. No thorns, no briars. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, if I'm taking verse 11 literally and the context literally, then I'm saying it's a great day when you preach the Word, yes, when you handle the Word of God. Amen. And don't you dare doubt it. Don't you dare complain at whatever God may do or whatever God may not do. Don't you dare open your mouth. You say, now, Lord, you call me to preach the Word when I was your man. And I'm going to stay at it till I die. Amen. And God will make the myrtle trees come up and the fir trees come up. And he'll get rid of the briars and thorns out of your life. And give you so much joy until the trees will clap their hand. You'll have your Amen. hallelujah time. Amen. Amen. Down here in the south, maybe some of you folk from the north. But down here in the south, we get excited about it. We have, we have camp meetings down here in the south. And, and people shout. At Tabernacle, sometimes our folk get happy. Yes, Amen. And they shout a bit. And I've been there a long time and I never got hurt. <laughs> the only thing that hurts is the pride of some sophisticated Baptist. Yes, but you handle the word of God and let the fir trees come up. You handle the word of God and let the trees start clapping their hands. Yes. You handle the word of God and you'll go forth with joy. And preaching then will be the delight of your very soul. God bless you.